Welcome to the beginning stages of our new project house for this season. It's a 16,000 square foot monster. I mean, it is a really big home. Now we've got nine bathrooms inside this house, which means a lot of plumbing. And even though it's a big home, the rules that we use here are gonna to apply to your home as well. We're working on the most important stage right now. It's called the plumbing rough end. The reason it's important is we're about to pour 350 yards of concrete on top of this, and we're gonna be locked down as soon as we do. It all starts with a set of plans and a trencher. The plumber digs trenches where the sanitary drainage and water lines will run. They mark the trench locations on the foundation form boards and use those as guidelines for digging the trenches. As they dig the trenches, the plumbers check to be sure that the slope for the sanitary drainage lines runs consistently downhill. The trenches have to maintain a downhill slope from the toilets and drains at the farthest part of the house all the way to the street where the house's plumbing connects to the city sewer line. At the street, a backhoe digs down to connect with the city sewer line, which is 8 to 10 feet below the surface in this case. The sewer line is so deep because every house on the street must be able to drain into it, running downhill. Once the trenches are in, the plumbers put string lines where the walls will go and use these as guidelines to place the pipes in exactly the right place, just inside the walls. The copper pipe that will run underneath the concrete slab is a flexible roll with no joints or seams. Wherever the copper pipe is going to pass through the concrete, it has to be sheathed with a protective layer of plastic or foam. That gives it room to expand and contract with heat and cold. Hot water lines are sheathed in red, cold water lines are blue. Once all the lines are in and the plumbing has passed inspection, the foundation crew fills in the plumbing trenches and recuts the trenches where the concrete beams will go. Then they spread a layer of cushion sand on top to help cushion the pipes buried below and evenly distribute the weight of the concrete. A layer of plastic is put on top of that to act as a moisture barrier, and the plumbing rough-in is done. Now here in our kitchen we have a great example of planning ahead. This is going to be an island with a sink in it. We've got to put our pipes in right now. You don't want to jackhammer that concrete up later. You're going to end up in getting into your post-tension cables or into your rebar if that's the way you poured your foundation. It's going to be hard to make it drain. You've got to plan ahead. Well, it may not look like a lot of plumbing, but this little area right here actually takes care of two bathrooms upstairs, plus a shower and a steam shower here in our cabana room. I'd really like for you to look at this copper manifold here because there's some interesting points. One, all of the joints are up above our foundation floor. We're going to pour concrete for this foundation. We need to get all of the joints up where if they ever leak or we have a problem, we have access to them. If they leak below the concrete foundation, it's going to be next to impossible to find the leak and we're going to, have to tear up a lot of concrete. It's going to be very expensive. All the joints need to be up in the air. Really need to watch how they put those joints together. I have a piece of copper here from a house that actually failed. As you can see, it's got a crack here on the side of it. The reason why is when they cut the pipe, they didn't really clean out all of the burrs and ridges in there. And what happens is when the water flows and it hits that little ridge, it disturbs the water. And that water made the turn, and over the years, it kept eating away at the side of that pipe, and they finally had a failure. Whenever they cut a piece of pipe, they really need to ream out the interior of that and make sure that it's really clean and smooth. One other thing to watch out for is the flux that they use to sweat the joints together. You do not want to use an oil-based flux. You want to use a water-based flux. The oil-based flux can actually build up on the interior and cause water flow problems and will end up with corrosion. The water-based flux, that won't be a problem. Let me show you one thing on the drain pipes over in the kitchen. Well, you notice on our four drains over here in the kitchen wall that we have actually a piece of pipe protruding from each one of them, and we have a cap on the end of that pipe. These are our clean outs. If we ever get a clog inside one of these pipes, the plumber just comes out to the outside of your house, because this is where our wall is, takes the cap off of it, runs a snake in there, and cleans out your drain. They don't have to come inside your house. They don't have to make a mess or tear up anything. They have easy access to each one of these caps. Whether you're building a 16,000 square foot house or a 1,600 square foot house, remember to plan out that plumbing in advance. You get it in the right spot, you're going to save a lot of money over jackhammering that concrete and moving it later. On your copper pipe, make sure the plumber cleans out the interior of that pipe, knocks down any burrs or ridges, and uses a water-based flux instead of an oil-based flux. A lot less corrosion, no leaks in the future.
Well, last week we roughed in all the plumbing on our project house and got all the pipes covered up and ready to go to what a lot of people consider the most important part of home building, and that's pouring the foundation. This is a backbone to our whole house, and if we have problems with this foundation, we're going to have problems with the rest of the house. Plus, it's going to be expensive to repair anything that goes wrong with the foundation, so we've got to do it right. Now we're building the project house this year in Dallas, Texas, and where we're at has a lot of expansive clay soil. When it rains, that soil can actually expand and rise maybe five, six inches. When it dries out in the summertime, that soil contracts back and forth. So that's a lot of motion going on beneath our foundation, so we've really got to build it right. Now this is a 16,000 square foot house, so we really went overboard to do it right. How far overboard? Well, we started by drilling holes for 128 concrete piers down to the bedrock. These piers will stabilize the foundation so it isn't floating on a shifting sea of expanding and contracting soil. The piers go down from 20 to 37 feet, depending on where the drilling rig hits the blue shale bedrock. Then just to be sure, the crew drills one additional foot right into the rock. Each pier is one foot in diameter. After the crew drills the holes for each pier, the area around the hole is cleared of all debris so nothing falls back into the hole. Then the crew marks the spot inside the hole where the top of the pier is to be. This spot is exactly 28 inches below what's going to be the surface of the concrete slab. Now it's time to pour the concrete into the pier. The concrete must not fill the pier hole to a level above the blue tag. If too much goes in, it must be taken out. The top of each pier has to be the exact same level. When the pier hole has been filled with concrete, two 20-foot lengths of steel rebar are placed into the pier for reinforcement. Earlier, the crew set form boards on the perimeter of the slab. These boards follow the exact outline of the foundation. The crew is putting such strong support on the outside of the form boards because these boards will have to contain thousands of pounds of concrete on the day the foundation is poured. But we're not there yet. Now the crew digs a grid work of deep trenches for the concrete beams. The beams will rest on the piers, so the trencher must be sure to cut the trenches right above where the piers are. Once the beam trenches are dug, the plumbers will come in and rough in the plumbing. When the plumbers have finished, the foundation crew comes back and fills in the trenches that the plumbers dug, then recuts the trenches where the concrete beams will go. The crew evens out the base for the concrete slab, removing dirt where necessary and adding a layer of fine cushion sand on top. Now the foundation begins to look like a giant waffle. A layer of plastic is put on top of it all to act as a moisture barrier between the sand and the concrete. Next, a grid work of long steel cables sheathed in plastic is laid out. These are called post-tension cables and they'll be buried inside the concrete. After the concrete is poured, these cables will be pulled tight like a tennis racket to give the foundation extra strength. Now our post-tension cables are no benefit if they're below the concrete foundation. They need to be in the concrete. So the guys add these little plastic chairs and they just clip right onto the cable. And then the cable sets down on top of it like so. That way when you have the weight of the concrete or anybody stepping on it while they're working on the foundation, it's right in the center. It doesn't go below the concrete. It's right where we want it to be. So when we stress it, it'll pull it all together. Besides the sheathing for our cables, you also see this gray conduit. This conduit is actually for a floor outlet, an electrical outlet that we're going to plug lamps into. We're a long ways away from a wall, but we are going to have furniture right here and we're going to need some table lamps, so we're putting the electricity right where we're going to need it in the floor. This will be the surface of the floor and the electrician will come back in, take this cover off, and go ahead and install a normal outlet cover. Much less expensive to do it now than it is to do it later. You see our big trenches and beams here, and down in the bottom you can see actually the top of a concrete pier. Now remember, we drilled those down and filled them up with concrete. Well now when we pour our big pour for our complete foundation, the concrete's going to go down in these beams and set on top of those piers to help hold the weight. And these beams actually form what's known as a matte foundation. The purpose of a matte foundation is to spread the weight of our foundation and of our house over a large area, much like a snowshoe. If you walk out in the snow, your feet sink down in it. You put on snowshoes, you stay on top. We're doing the exact same thing with the foundation. Looks like they pretty much got it ready, so now it's time to pour the concrete. The foundation of our project house will take 350 yards of concrete. That's about 40 trucks full. On the day of the pour, everything has to go like clockwork because as soon as the concrete comes out of the pump trucks, it begins to harden. 
Concrete is a mix of cement, water, sand, rock, and other materials that can be blended together in an endless number of combinations, depending on what kind of concrete you want. For the project house, we're using what's called a five sack mix. That's five sacks of cement per cubic yard of concrete. This mix will harden to handle a load of 3,500 pounds per square inch. One yard of our concrete mix has roughly 375 pounds of concrete, 1,800 pounds of rock, 1,500 pounds of sand, 30 gallons of water, and 95 pounds of fly ash. The fly ash interacts with the cement in a chemical reaction so the concrete will keep gaining strength year after year. As the pour goes on, a member of the crew goes around the perimeter tapping the form board to settle out any air pockets or honeycombs that may have occurred. Other members of the crew rake the surface of the concrete with a metal drag bar so that the surface of the slab is perfectly level. As the concrete begins to harden, the crew smooths and trowels the surface and for a final touch, they give the surface a once over with a troweling machine to even out whatever humps, dips, and ridges remain. The whole job from start to finish has taken just under five hours. Well, it's hard to believe by looking at it, but it's been one week since we poured the concrete foundation. And as you can tell, a lot of work's been going on, the frame's been going up. The guys have come back on our post-tension cables and pre-tensioned the cables the day after the pour. That means they put some pressure on it to pull that concrete together because the nature of concrete is it's gonna crack. This cable pulled it all together. They put about 3,500, 3,800 pounds of pressure on the cable. Here's how they do it. Steve's doing the post tension right now a week later. They hook a ram to it and that ram pulls on that cable and pulls it out. There's two wedges they've installed inside there so the cable doesn't back in. And they're taking it up to about 7,800 pounds of pressure. That's what the engineer called for, the structural engineer who designed this foundation. It's a big foundation, but that's a lot of pressure. By pulling it together, we add a lot of tensile strength to the concrete. The more you can compress the concrete, the stronger it's going to be and less problems we're going to have in the future. We shouldn't have any major cracks come apart on this. The foundation should stay in one complete piece. That means our walls will look good. We're not going to have a lot of drywall cracks or anything like that. But we don't leave it here. We're not going to walk away looking like this. Sean's about to come in with the saw and we're going to cut all these cables off and mortar over it so it looks just like the rest of the foundation. With 128 piers over 20 feet deep, plus a matte foundation and the post tension to pull it all together, we should have a solid foundation that will last many generations to come. Well, it's hard to believe that we poured the concrete for the foundation of our project house just two weeks ago. As you can tell, we're well into the framing stage on the 16,000 square foot monster. Now there's a lot of different things that happen at this stage that can be useful for you no matter what size home you're building. Come on and I'll show you what I mean. Well, framing is just like anything else. You start from the ground up and when you start at the ground on a wall, it's with your base plate. Now that's this board along the bottom here that all the studs are nailed to. So you can tell this one's a different color than the rest of the studs in our house. All of this is southern yellow pine, but this base plate that we got from Georgia Pacific, it's a different color because it's pressure treated. It has chemicals in it to help prevent it from weathering, from getting moist, and also to keep out termites. Termites won't eat this pressure treated plate. They like this lumber up here. Once they get to this, they turn around and go somewhere else. So whenever you're building a house, you want a pressure treated base plate on it. You also want to bolt it down. When we poured our concrete foundation, we put a J bolt in the concrete itself while it was still wet. Drill the hole in our base plate and set the wall on top of it and put a washer and a nut. That's to hold it down in place. If the house ever gets hit by a high wind, we don't want it to tip over, so we bolt it down. We don't just nail it down. On our exterior wall studs, these are two by six studs that we got from Georgia Pacific. Again, southern yellow pine. Now we didn't go with the two by four for a few different reasons. One, we have a lot of weight on this house and we need a lot of strength to hold it up. This is 50% thicker than a two by four, about 40% stronger. So this was our choice. We also want real low utility bills. This wall is again, 50% thicker than a two by four. Instead of putting R13 insulation in, we can do R19. The higher the number, the more insulated it is, which means lower utility bills. One thing you might notice a little different on this stud is it's not a continuous piece of lumber. It actually has a joint right here. That's known as a finger joint. It's a very special technique on building studs. Let me show you more about it. Now on the interior of the house, instead of using a two by six stud, we went the two by four stud. These are southern yellow pine from Temple Inland. 
And we use a two by four inside because we're not bearing as much weight. Plus we don't insulate this wall. There's no insulation whatsoever. So we don't need to spend the money to go to a wider wall. But again, we do have the finger jointed area here on our studs. And there's a number of different reasons. And I've got a pro to tell us why. Kathy Cake from the Southern Pine Council and appreciate you coming in today. Nice to see you, Michael. Well, tell me a little bit about the finger jointed studs. And I see you've got a cutaway right here. Yes. Why are they so important? Well, they're really good because they provide a very straight, stable product. That means they have less tendency to warp and twist than some solid saw on um, stud walls. And they're also very environmentally friendly because we use trims from the end of the sawmills as we make the lumber. So we use the waste from there to make them. And so we don't waste any of the tree. So what would have been waste or thrown out, you actually make a real stud out of. And you said it's, it's straighter and stronger. so. When we look down a wall, our walls are actually going to be straight for right. the first time. Right, so we're going to have, it's much easier to put on your drywall and you won't have as many nail pops or callbacks. Yeah, and I guess it's straighter because it's a lot of short pieces, isn't it, from there to there? Yes, the pieces so. are typically between 5 and 24 inches long. And they have a uh, finger joint profile that's cut on both ends. And then those finger joints are put together. There's some special adhesive that it's applied and then they're squeezed and made in one continuous ribbon and then they're cut to the length that we need for our stud wall. That's yeah. great. And no waste, like you said, and then if we had one continuous piece, it has more of a chance to twist, but since we have a lot of short pieces, they're not going to twist exactly. or warp on us. Right. That's great. How about as far as price, comparing a, what people would think of as a normal stud to a finger jointed stud? The, the price um, overall is going to be a little bit more probably than a solid saw and stud on a piece for piece basis. But when you look at an installed cost, it can be the same or even less because you have less waste and because you have less pieces that um, are going to warp or twist. And so it just provides a much better wall, less callbacks. Yeah, a lot less warranty like you were talking about. Right. So for uh, basically the same amount of money, we can have a stronger, straighter wall and it's environmentally friendly at the same time. Exactly. Well, while we're in the framing stage, there's a few other aspects that are very important you really need to see. Let's take a look. Well, it's been a couple of weeks, so we're a lot further along in the framing stage. The guys have been working hard. There's a few things I wanted to remind you about building a strong house, because your home's always being hit by winds. If it's not really built strong, you're going to start to see your drywall crack and some nail pops. If it gets a really big wind, a tornado or a hurricane, it could knock it down. If you remember, when we poured our concrete foundation, we put in anchor bolts. The framing crew has come back and set the walls right on top of those anchor bolts. They drilled holes in the bottom plate, set them on top of the bolts that are in the concrete, and then put on a washer and a nut. That's to make a secure fitting right there so it all holds together in a high wind. Up top, we've done it a little different. Here we have some rafters where they're hitting our top plate. Now, a lot of builders just put a nail on each side of the rafter into the top plate. But the problem is when the wind hits it, it can just pull it out just like a giant hammer. That wind hits the side of your house, comes up and hits the overhang and just takes your roof right off. And when the roof comes off, the house falls over. To prevent that from happening, we've added rafter clips. You can see they just started this one and you can see behind me all the other ones that they have added. Now that little piece of steel attaches to the top plate of our wall and it attaches to the rafter. For a wind to take our roof off now, it has to be so strong that it actually shears these nails in half or it rips the steel apart. So it can withstand about three times as much wind and still keep your roof on the house. On the exterior of the house, we put an oriented strand board, OSB. We nailed it into our wall studs. We nailed it into the top plate. The crew nailed it into the bottom plate also. Again, to make one uniform structure. So we're bolted to the foundation. We've got nails in all of our studs to this exterior sheathing. Plus we've got our rafter clips on, so we've got a very strong house. And doing all of these features only cost a few hundred dollars. So if you're building a new home, make sure they do it to your house. Well, as our project house moves along, the framing crew has completed our flooring system. Now the ceilings are so high in this house and the rooms are so big, we needed a special system to support all of that weight, but also to remain smooth for our flooring and smooth for the ceiling on the downstairs area. To do that, we didn't use normal dimensional lumber. We used engineered wood. Let's go downstairs and take a look. Okay. 
Here are some samples of the different types of engineered wood that we're using in our project house. It's a good idea to get your complete flooring system from one manufacturer because that way it's all engineered to the exact same specification. We got all of ours from Willamette and we've got an expert with us today, Chris Degnan. Good to have you here, Chris. Thanks, Michael. Great to be here. Uh, take us across. We're starting over here. We don't want our floor to squeak and you got some eye joists. Tell us a little bit about how they're built. Exactly. Starting with the eye joists, Michael. Uh, this uh, floor framing product is uh, starting with a, a highly engineered OSB web product in the middle. So it's oriented strand board. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on the top we have LVL or laminated veneer lumber flanges, which is uh, veneers of pine that's uh, glued together. Okay, so it's like a piece of plywood but they're all going in the same direction. So all in one direction, off. right, for, for one directional stiffness on the, on the flange itself. And now how does that compare to a normal piece of lumber that's the same size? Let's say we had a 2 by 12 it looks like, as far well, as strength. The great thing about it is uh, as far as strength and stiffness you get a stronger piece right here and actually using uh, about one third less wood fiber. Okay, so we're using mm -hmm. less material, we're cutting down fewer trees. Now over here you have some bigger eye joists, uh, looks like a 16 inch. And on top you've gone with uh, plywood for our floor decking instead of oriented strand board. How come? Right, Michael, in this house we have a, a couple of different sizes of eye joists depending on uh, the span and the strength that we need. Uh, we've gone with the inch and an eighth sturdy floor plywood. Uh, because this is a high-end house with very high walls, we're looking for a very strong, very stable flooring. This is what we've gone with the inch and an eighth plywood floor. So to put this together in the flooring system, we would typically glue the top of the flange, place the plywood down, and then either nail or screw this on to uh, attach the floor stably and strongly to the system. And it's important to do that glue to make sure just to back up those nails and screws that it's not moving at all. The glue is very important, right, to get the tight, strong bond that you need to keep everything stable. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it looks like here you've got a rim board. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing with that. Michael, this is the rim board plus, and the way this is used, it uh, encloses the eye joist structure. It would actually be placed on the ends of the eye joists, such as this, going across. Okay. It uh, provides uh, both lateral support as it's nailed onto the eye joist and vertical support to the outside bearing wall coming down. Okay, so we're definitely this. gonna have a sturdy floor then. Exactly. Looking at, and then here it looks like you have a giant piece of LVL. What are you using this for? Well, the LVL will be used um, as, a, as a little more uh, structurally strong component than the eye joist would be. Um, you may use a piece of LVL in place of an eye joist in your flooring system if you have a uh, load bearing wall above it and you need the extra strength that the LVL will give you over the eye joist. Okay, so if we have a room right above our second floor there and the wall sitting there and that goes all the way up to maybe the roof or, or is supporting that, the houseway. That would way. be a good example of a place where LVL could be used. Okay, that's what we're going to use. Right. And then you've got the monster. you got the glue lamp. The glue lamp beam. Okay. Uh, manufactured in many different sizes, um, very dimensionally stable. We're able to get a stronger piece of lumber uh, than we would out of a single piece of lumber this size. The stronger laminations are going to be on the top and the bottom of these beams carrying the load um, as, it, as it would tend to pull down or up depending on how the load is in the house. Yeah. Um, where we get um, longer spans of the eye joist, we would have uh, the uh, glue line beam in between hanging from uh, the eye joist would be hanging from the glue lamp beam, uh, supporting intermediate spans of the eye joist. Okay, well that's going to make for a very strong floor. Let's actually go in the other room where we've got some samples of all this built into the house. Great. Well, Chris, we have a huge room here, and I see you've got the eye joist all the way across to support all that weight from upstairs. Right, Michael, this is a great example of uh, the advantages of the eye joist engineered wood flooring system. We've got about a 20, 26 foot span room in here and that's just not something that would be possible with solid wood 2 by 10 or 2 by 12. Yeah, we'd have to have some posts or columns in here. Exactly. We? And now we have a great big open room. It's a huge room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can support that weight. And then here you have a giant glue lamp on the end of this going across this wall. Right. As good as the eye joist system is, we still can't, we still can't span 40, 50 feet. So this is where we'll break the span with a large glue lamb, and you can see this glue lamb is manufactured to the same depth as the eye joist so that we have a very smooth ceiling all the way across here. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, it looks like it's going to be super strong, it's supporting a lot of weight. Right. And then over here, your green board is your LVL that you got up? 
This is a great example of a placement of, uh, of a double piece of LVL, right. And what we would have above there is a bearing wall in the, uh, in the living space above. Upstairs, okay. Mm -hmm. So we needed that instead of the eye joist at that one position. Exactly. Even though it looks like a uh, ceiling, it's actually a floor, isn't it? It's actually a flooring system supporting uh, living space above, that's right. Well, thanks for the help. I'm going to run upstairs and check out that Great. floor. Thanks, Michael. We're now at week six on our project house and the framing crew has made a lot of progress. Most of the frame is up. It's time to put on our exterior sheathing and our roof decking. Now we're using oriented strand board, commonly known as OSB, but we're doing it with a twist because we want to make this house as energy efficient as possible. Let's go downstairs and take a look. Here's an example of oriented strand board. You can actually see the wood pieces in here are actually the strands. They've been compressed together to make a super strong surface. Now we're going to use this for our exterior sheathing, but we're also using it for a roof decking with a modification. It actually has a radiant barrier on it. It's called Tech Shield, and it's going to save us money every month that we live in that home. We brought Julie Cole in to explain a little bit about it, and thanks for joining us, Julie. Thank you. Now tell me at LP how you came up with this. It looks like an aluminum foil that's actually laminated on the decking. That's exactly what it is. It's aluminum foil with a craft paper backer that we laminate to the standard OSB. We also do plywood sheathing. Okay. The aluminum foil acts as a radiant barrier and heat, the sun's heat, radiant heat, radiant energy is absorbed into the roof deck through the shingles and into the wood of your roof deck. On any house? On any home. Okay. Aluminum foil acts as a low emitter of radiant heat. Basically that means that the radiant heat that's being absorbed into your roof deck is not being given off into the attic. So we're not going to superheat our attic in the Absolutely. summertime? Absolutely. Well, you know I'm from Missouri, so I noticed that you brought a tool to prove it to me here. Yep. And uh, this gun, we're going to measure the heat that's radiating off there. And let's see, we're at 129 on our oriented strand board. We'll come over here to our tech shield side, 91 degrees, almost 40 degrees difference, huge it's a difference. difference. Yeah, so that is going to save us a lot of money every month. Absolutely. How about in the winter time? What's it do then? Same type of thing. We've actually done a study with two identical homes, one side by side, one with tech shield, one with standard roof decking on it. And we uh, showed, we proved that there was a lower energy usage every single month during that year. Not just summertime, but all year round. Absolutely. Okay, if we put this on a house, what can we expect to save approximately on our utility bills? Well, our study showed that in temperatures upwards of 90 degrees, on the kilowatt hours used to cool the home during the summer, we saved up to 16.5%. Wow, huge savings. So it's going to pay for itself really quickly. Yes, it will. Well, as a home builder, Julie, why I prefer it over all the other radiant bearers is it's actually laminated to the decking, so it's easy to install. Just put it on like a normal deck. Absolutely. No change in uh, construction practices whatsoever. That's great. Well, thanks a lot, Julie. Okay. Let's go to the outside, take a look at our exterior sheathing. On the outside, we're sheathing the project house with OSB from Willamette Industries. Notice that the stamp says APA. That means that this product has been approved by the APA, the Engineered Wood Association. The APA is a nonprofit industry trade association that sets standards for all engineered wood products. When you see the APA stamp, you know that the product has been manufactured to the highest industry standards for quality performance and reliability. As far as exterior sheathing, reliability is everything. Now OSB is super strong and it's tying everything together. We have our base plate nailed into, we're nailing right up our wall studs, we're going to nail into our top plates, so we make one uniform structure that's super strong. If you don't have the budget for your new home to do the whole house, at least do your corners. A lot of builders like to go cheap and just put a one by four strip of wood across a few studs with a couple nails in it to try to hold them together. You need to go ahead and wrap it with OSB at all of your corners. If you don't, when the winds start hitting your house, your home is going to rack back and forth. A box is a good example. When the wind hits it, your house starts doing this. And what happens is all of your drywall inside of your house starts to crack and the nails start to pop out. Then if you ever get in a really bad storm, say a tornado or a hurricane, your house can go over. So go ahead and spend the money, wrap it with oriented strand board. We're several weeks into the construction of this year's project house and it's time to put on the roof. 
We're building this house in Texas where thunderstorms, hailstorms, and even tornadoes damage or destroy thousands of roofs every year. We want to protect our house against that kind of severe weather, so we're putting a super roof on this house, a metal roof with a 50-year warranty. The roof we're putting on this project house is a stone-coated steel roof from Girard. Well, the Girard metal roofing system begins right here with these wooden battens that the guys have put on the roof. For more information about it, I've got Ed Horn from Horn Brothers with us. Hey, Thanks Mike, for joining you? us today. Hey, tell me about how this Girard system really works. Well, this house being new construction, we put ice and water shield in all the valleys, and then we have a 30-pound felt over the entire deck. So no leaks, no exactly. matter what. And then we put on the batten system. They're spaced 14 and a half inches, the uh, width of the tile. Okay. And the tile starts at the top, and then the next piece is just interlock, like this is pretty easy. Slides in place. And then they're fastened this way with the nail gun. Okay, you're going to shoot the nails into the side of the batten instead of into the top That's of the batten. That's correct. That gives us that great uh, 125 mile hour up wind uplift. Okay, so if a wind is hitting a shingle, it can normally peel a shingle up and just right. pull it out. But right. since the nail's in the side, I guess you're going to have to break the nail in half to actually That's correct. rip a shingle off. Yep. Will it last very long? Uh, we've got a lifetime guarantee, 50 year transferable. Wow. So it's about the best in the business. Yeah. Now it looks uh, somewhat like a conventional shingle, at least as far as the aggregate being on it, but when you flip it up, you can see it is actually a steel shingle. All right, it's made of a 26 gauge steel, and then it's coated with uh, acrylic polymer rosins, and then it's got the stone chips embedded into it and baked yeah. on. And why do you put the chips on it? What's the purpose behind uh, that? For the aesthetics, uh, it protects the steel and it gives you the long life. Yeah, and you could walk on the roof, right. don't you? Yeah, it doesn't slip at all. Yeah, that's great. Well, it looks really sharp, but I noticed you've got some other samples right behind you. Tell me about that. Right, this uh, style is the uh, traditional tile style. Okay. It comes with the rounder edges. Then we have a shake profile that looks more like the uh, wood shakes when you're all finished. Sure. It comes in about 12 different colors. We've got your browns, your reds, cedars. And yeah. then we've also got a new product, which is uh, more of the traditional composition look. Uh -huh. It goes right over the deck. It doesn't have a batten system. Okay, so it's real easy to install then. Exactly. Yeah. And you've got a 30-year guarantee with this one, and you've got the benefits of the steel and the raw coating. Well, I really like this one with the battens and everything because you end up with an air pocket between your shingle and your and your roof decking. So that's that, right. That's going to help insulate it. it yeah, great. It's a great insulator. You've got the dead air space that's always moving. Okay. Now, this is just a flat area to install shingles on, so it's mm -hmm. basically uh, pretty simple. But I know All we've right. got some tricky parts over here. Let's go take a look. Sounds good. Ed, earlier you said you, that you put an ice shield here in our valley, but I noticed that you've also got a piece of metal in there. Uh, what's this for? Well, Michael, the uh, valleys are one of the trickier parts of the roof because all the water is draining off these two fields. It's all going to come together in this little trough. We don't want to have any leaks. So we've got the ice and water shield, we've got the felt paper, and then we put this trough in here to cover uh, that catches all the water. Looks like you guys custom cut it and bent right. the edges and everything. Yeah, every piece with the angle is uh, custom measured, cut, bent, and then put, put back in. The first half is going to go to the middle, and mm -hmm. the next half is going to come here, meet it in the middle, and you'll have just a nice straight line that the water will okay, go so through. Okay, so we're not going to have any of this galvanized stuff exposed where we're going to see it or anything like that. Right, so. it's a totally concealed valley, but it's watertight. I like that. How about other protrusions in the roof? Here we've got a big uh, metal flue sticking out. What do you do around that? Okay, the first base of the pipe is connected to the deck, and that's sealed. And then we have another boot that goes across the top of that. That we have the drawer cut in around the bottom. We'll seal that and put some stone coated chips all around there. And then what else is sticking up for the top, we'll paint that so that it, you won't see that silver. That's good. That'd be great. How about our PVC pipe that's sticking out right above that? For the smaller pipes, we have a, a stone coated flashing that goes to the base of it. And then we also put some sealant around the top stone coat that so it looks like it just kind of grew out of the roof but it's totally watertight. Good, good. Well we're going to be consistent on our color then everything will look good and I don't, nothing shiny. Speaking of shiny I don't see any type of ventilation system for our roof so I take it you're using some sort of ridge vent here? Right we have a ridge vent system that goes right next to the ridge and um, the hot air from the attic will come out these holes and it won't let any water or bugs in because we have a cap that goes over the top. Okay. So you have a constant airflow from the E vents through the house, out the ridge vent. Okay, so we're not going to have any heat buildups. We're going to have low utility bills, no moisture problems. Right, and you won't have any low profile attic vents or any whirly birds. Yeah. 
Well, now that the project house is framed and wrapped, it's time to install the windows. And believe it or not, we have 105 windows in this home. Now, you normally choose your windows according to your personal taste, your budget, and energy efficiency. For the project house, we chose vinyl windows from Symington. Let's go inside and I'll show you why. Well, here we have a nice example of a vinyl frame window that's been cut away. And Bill Laser from Simonton's one with the saw who actually cut this. Hey. <laughs> hey, Bill, tell me a little bit about vinyl windows and why they've become so popular. Sure. Uh, vinyl window is a low-maintenance product. It's becoming a product of choice for many builders and, and remodelers in, in across the country. Our vinyl extrusions are welded to both the sash and frame to provide exceptional strength and prohibits air infiltration and water infiltration. Well, I noticed when I picked it up, being a cutaway, you'd think it'd be pretty flimsy, but this thing, I mean, is super strong when you try to twist it. Absolutely. That's a strong window frame. You also notice, too, that in some of our cavities here, um, these provide a dual purpose. Uh, the, the cavities also provide some structural integrity and it promotes dead air space, and dead air is a very good air insulator. Yeah, that will be good. And how about the air in between our panes of glass here? What do you do in there to help that become a better insulator? Well, for years we've been using uh, what's called an insulating glass unit. It's two panes of glass with a non-conductive spacer in between. Uh, the two panes of glass are sealed, and we put a, an inert gas called argon in between. Now, argon is, is very slow reacting to heat, so the molecules don't move around as fast, so the heat exchange or cool, cooling exchange is not, is not promoted as much. Okay, so with the vinyl frame, the argon gas, the low E coating on the inside, we're going to have low utility bills for this window. Absolutely. Price-wise, is it pretty competitive with a metal frame window? A metal frame window, it's, it's going to be a little bit more money, but you're going to have less maintenance and you're going to have better energy efficiency. I'd, I'd rather save money every month on the utility bill. Well, Bill, tell me a little bit about the windows we're using here in the family room. Well, Michael, this uh, particular window, because of its size and dimension, we chose a, a single hung window, which means it has an operating sash on the bottom and a fixed sash on top. One thing I like about this uh, single hung window down here is these tilt outs. It makes it easy to clean, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. it looks good. How about the rest of the house? What type of windows well, have we got here? We have crank outs or casement windows. Some of the other windows that we use were operating arch tops, which are similar to this uh, window, but it has a rounded top on it on it, a little geometric shape, and a, a complementary picture window, which is called an eyebrow with an extended leg that looks uh, pretty much like the single hung, but it doesn't operate. And this house is typical of a, of a lot of new construction homes being built today with a lot of geometric shapes. A lot of people really using windows as design elements now. now. Absolutely, yes sir. Okay. How about the Energy Star program here? I see the window's got the sticker on it. Energy Star is a government program from the Department of Energy, so uh, the standards are pretty strict, and because it is a government program, homeowners can be uh, assured that they're getting the most energy efficient windows in the marketplace today. So when you're buying windows, always look for that sticker? Absolutely. All right, well that'll save us money every month. Bill, thanks for all the help. Michael, thank you. If you'd like a great set of windows for your house, no matter what material they're made out of, you need them to be energy efficient, they need to fit your budget, and they need to look great. The crew is just finishing up installing our exterior doors, and we actually have 10 exterior doors on this monster project house that we're building. Now there's a lot of things to consider when you're choosing doors, like energy efficiency, because there's a lot of glass there. Plus you need to consider budget, how they're going to look, and how they're going to function. Our doors aren't sliding doors, they're actually hinge doors. You also need to choose the material they're going to be built out of. Ours is extruded vinyl, it's got a lot of interesting qualities. Let's go take a look. We've got someone here to help us a little bit with the door. We've got Bill Laser from Simonton. Good to have you here, Bill. Michael, thanks for having us back. Hey, I know vinyl's low maintenance, but you've got a lot of other features in this door. Explain it to me. Well, first off, we start off by using a, a virgin PVC vinyl. It won't rot, warp, chip, paint, blister, so the homeowner can virtually uh, forget about maintenance. Perfect building material. Yes, a little, okay. bit of, a little bit of soap and water keeps the door looking great for years. On the end, you notice these uh, multi-chambered profiles here. The chambers actually provide a lot of structural integrity for the product, and because they're enclosed, they provide dead air. And as you know, dead air is a great insulator against heat and cold. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. So it's going to be really strong, it's going to be energy efficient. What else? Well, some of the other features we have is this 15 degree, uh, 15 degree sloped aluminum seal to help facilitate water re removal. And, and okay. combined with this applied drip mold, water just runs right off. Okay, so we're never going to have any leaks around this door. No, That's not a problem with a lot of patio doors. So that's not going to be a problem with ours. Not, not with this door, it's not. Okay. Uh, some of the other things we have is uh, this uh, high compression sill bulb that runs with the jam and the seal around the door. Uh, very flexible when the door is shut and closed and engaged, it creates a really airtight and watertight seal. Great, great. Uh, the frame and sash are welded for strength. And one of the really unique features about this door is the full length anodized aluminum gear hinge. 
Now yeah. this gear hinge runs the full length of the door and the way it's engaged, it completely seals the door 33% against air and water infiltration. You can actually see those gears move right on top of each other. And, when and because they're engaged like that, the, the door is virtually impossible to rack. Plus you got this cover on the exterior, so we're not gonna see those hinges inside the it's house. It's aesthetically pleasing, sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just all gonna be white. Yeah, speaking of aesthetics, I really like your door handle system here. This is a solid brass multi-point locking system. And by multi-point, I mean that uh, it has more than one contact point. Okay. To engage the multi-points, you simply lift up on the handle and they engage themselves into the jam system, pulling the door very tight and secure. Okay, and you've got two of those, one at the bottom and then one at the top, and then your deadbolt comes out here in the middle? That's correct. When, when the multi-point locking is engaged, and you, you then can engage the deadbolt for a third contact point, providing really ultimate security. Okay, I know we picked this for nine of our openings in the house, but one of them's a little different. Explain the French door to me. The front of the house is really the focal point of this place, and uh, we had a unique problem there because the, the architect called for a seven foot by nine foot opening. We used the French door with some custom made side lights and a quarter, uh, extended leg quarter round transom to give you the height and width that was dictated for the opening. And you, you get a very, very nice panoramic view because those French door panels both open up 180 degrees. It's gonna be an outstanding focal point for the house. Yeah, it's a great looking door. Now Bill, the glass treatment on that door is a little different from the rest of the house. Explain that to us. Well, because of the front of the house has a sculptured colonial grid pattern, we've chosen to put those same sculptured colonial grids in the transom, the side lights, and the French door. Makes for a good looking door. Now these doors face out the back side of our house, and we're going to have a nice pool and a lot of things to look at, so you went clear there. But I know energy efficiency is a concern because we have a lot of glass in these doors. And I believe you brought some tests for us to look at? Yeah, we have a very compelling demonstration that shows just how efficient that glass has become. Well, let's go take a look. Sure. All right, Bill, explain your heat lamp and your meter here to us. Well, this is a very simple system. Basically, the heat lamp provides a heat source, and this is a BTU meter, which measures the heat exchange. Okay, and it looks like we're at approximately 270. So okay. you've got some glass panels to set in there? Uh, the first one is just a basic monolithic or single piece of glass, which is common in a lot of homes today. Okay, knocks it down to about 200. Okay. okay. The next one is a, an IG unit, two pieces of glass with a spacer, but just with dead air in the middle. Okay. Well, that's great. It's knocked it down below 170, so that's a big help. And the last piece is a low-E coated Energy Star compliant piece of glass that we put in this house with all the doors and all the windows. Wow. Knocked it down to 50. So a huge savings then on our utility bills. Probably not going to fade out our carpets or furniture or you drapes get, as much either. You get some either. great UV benefits from it too, yes. Okay. Bill, I appreciate all the help. Thank you, Michael. People have been building homes with brick for over 4,000 years, and it's easy to see why. For one thing, brick is very easy to work with. With just brick, mortar, and some very simple tools, brick masons can build almost anything. From graceful architectural features, like these arches we're building for the back porch of the project house, to something simple like the basic barbecue grill. We've designed our project house to last for many generations to come, so the very best option on the exterior was to go with brick. It's extremely durable, it's weather resistant, it's fireproof. Now we used over 90,000 bricks in our project house, and there's a lot of options you can do with the brick exterior. Come over here and let me show you. Well, since we're going to talk about brick, we got the world's leading brick expert with us, Harold Melton from Acme Brick. Thanks for joining us, Harold. Thank you, Michael. Hey, tell us a little bit about durability. I see you've got some old bricks that you brought with you. Michael, we love to talk about durability in the brick business. I have with me this morning two brick, both of which are more than 2,000 years old. This brick was taken from the Forum in Rome more than, more than 2,000 years ago. Wow. This, the Forum was built more than 2,000 years ago. That's old. And this brick was taken from the Great Wall of China. Oh, really? This brick also is more than 2,000 years old. This is what the wall's actually built out of. That's uh, one of the brick. That's amazing. So uh, Agme can do that 100-year warranty. You, you're not worried about that, are you? We don't uh, worry about that at all. <laughs> okay. Now, I noticed you brought a lot of different samples here, and we did talk about options. Uh, you've got solid colors. You've got mixes. It looks like handmade brick. Tell me a little bit about the different options. Michael, we, we, we produce hundreds of different blends of brick and this product when used with a mortar color that matches is a product that could give us a monolithic uh, a Mediterranean look okay. which is very much like some of the stucco 
fake stucco products that you find on the market today. So if we want that look, skip the stucco and just use the same color mortar with the brick? Yes. This product is a handmade product that we produce on a new auto, totally automated plant. And these, these products are made to duplicate products that have been made for the last hundreds of years here in the U.S. and thousands of years worldwide. It's got a lot of texture to it. A lot of texture, beautiful product. Yeah. And this is an Acme Handmade. Yeah, that is really nice. It'd be great if you want that historic look or if you're remodeling in a historic yeah, district. Yeah, it's yeah. terrific. Now here's what we've got on the house. Tell me a little bit about this. Well, this too is a product that is made to look somewhat like used brick that you find in the market today. And as you see, when used with this color mortar, it gives you a beautiful look. Okay, but you process these different because those have holes in them yes. and everything, so. Th these brick are made with extrusion equipment. Okay. This brick is made uh, with mold equipment. So here we simply toss the mud mechanically into a mold, release them, and then they go through the process just like these. These are more squirted like a hamburger machine would make them through an extrusion process and there we can create the holes, reduce the weight, and therefore uh, reduce the price we charge you for and you still get the, the good look. Now how do you know you have a good brick? There's got to be a few tests that a homeowner can do to know that they've got a good brick. What do you, what do, you do? If you, have, if you have loose brick available that you can pick up and ring, what we attempt to do is create a brick that has the same ring that you would have if you, if you buy fine china and that is a that's a good sound. That's a there. good sound. That's okay. correct. That's a that's a very good quality brick. Okay. And you got a hundred year warranty. You're never gonna have to paint it, not gonna have to repair it. And the Pretty termites won't eat it. Yeah, there you go. So it's a great finish for right. it. It is. Basically maintenance free product. Okay. Over here I noticed that you've brought a lot of different colors of uh, mortar that we can actually use with the brick. So we can really go for any design we want, can't we? We can. Most homeowners don't realize the mortar in that wall is probably in the range of about 20% of the wall. So you can simply change the mortar look and not only then do you have the hundreds and maybe even thousands of brick choices, when you then add a mortar change to those brick, you, you really have an unlimited number of looks that you can get. Let's go up against the wall and compare them. Yeah, just changing that mortar really affects the way it looks, doesn't sure it? sure does, Michael. We talked a few minutes ago about the hundreds of brick selections that we have, yeah. but when we add colored mortar to the wall, yeah. since colored mortar constitutes something uh, uh, about 20% of the wall, we can get almost any effect we like and therefore maybe get thousands of options yeah. when, we, when we change brick as well as use different kinds of mortar. Yeah, definitely a lot of choices. If you're thinking about buying a new house, brick is a great choice. Thanks, Thanks for joining us Thank today. you, Michael. It's going to take 30 tons of conditioned air to heat and cool our 16,000 square foot project house. And with all that equipment, all that duct work, and all that interior space to make comfortable year round, we need to make sure we're using the most energy efficient and cost effective system possible. We're using a system from Unico that distributes the conditioned air in an interesting and unique way. And for the second floor, we're using a super energy efficient system from Linux. When we talk about HVAC, what that stands for is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Now we have two units, one inside which is the evaporative cooler. You normally find those in the attic or in the basement. And you have one outside which is the condensing unit. Now the normal problem is when you crank this on, it makes a lot of noise. And we've got a master bedroom right next to it, and that noise is going to go all through the night. And we've actually got eight units on this house, so that could be a lot of noise. I've got someone to help me with that, and that's Gary Bedard from Linux. How you doing, Michael? I'm doing great. Tell me how we're going to get this thing to be quiet so we don't wake up everybody in the house all night long. Actually, Michael, this unit is 16 times quieter than your average uh, HVAC condensing unit. Why is that? Well, there's three reasons why. The first reason is uh, this enclosure here, the compressor, which is the main component outside, is actually enclosed in an insulated area of the cabinet. So the sound is contained within this little area and you don't hear it on the Great. inside. Great. So it'll absorb the noise in there. Right. The second okay. reason is that this particular uh, condensing unit uses the non-chlorine refrigerant 
that does not harm the ozone layer. And the compressor that we use for it actually has a thicker shell around it. Okay. Uh, this particular compressor is a scroll compressor and it's exceptionally quiet because the metal encasing is actually thicker than you might normally find. So we're going to trap as much noise as possible right inside the unit and then actually inside the box we're going to insulate that as well to trap that noise? That's correct. Okay. And the third reason is the only other source of noise is the air that you blow with the fan. This particular fan is designed, it looks very different than a normal fan, mm -hmm. and it kind of slices right through the air very quietly and very efficiently so that you don't hear it. Well, Gary, as well as being quiet, how is the unit as far as efficiency for our utility bills? Well, actually, it's incredibly efficient. Um, normally, we see 10 here as the typical air conditioner. This one is up to 15, so you can wow. think of it as 50% 50, 50 greater efficiency. So a lot lower utility bills. Exactly. Okay, well, this takes care of outside with the condensing unit. Let's go inside and take a look at the evaporative unit. Sure. Well, Gary, this is the unit that we're going to be using up in the attic, and can you tell me what's special about it and why you selected this one for the project house? Sure, Michael. As we talked outside, uh, outside the home, noise is very important. Well, inside the home, it's even more important because this is where you live. Mm -hmm. And this particular unit is a furnace, and of course it operates as the air conditioner in cooling season, and this is exceptionally quiet as well. Okay. Let me show you why. Inside of this unit is a variable speed blower motor. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. And what you'll notice when I first turn it on is that you don't hear anything. Oh, is it on right now? It is on right now. Okay. And the reason you don't hear anything is the unit actually slowly ramps up. What we've discovered is that people don't like sudden starts and stops. That big boom when your unit comes on. Exactly. Makes noise in the whole house. And okay. what this will do is it will slowly over a period of about 45 seconds ramp up to a certain speed. In fact, in cooling mode, it does contribute to a slightly higher level of efficiency. Yeah. Well, now it's picked up some speed. It has. Now it's really running. Okay. And in its normal operation, the unit is 94% efficient. Wow. Super efficient. Low utility bills and it's quiet. I like it. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, besides the units inside and outside of the house, we did some other very special things to our HVAC system. Let's go take a look. To make the project house more efficient and save energy, we're dividing our HVAC system into zones. Zoning the system will allow us to customize each room's climate according to our needs. We zone the system by installing round dampers from Honeywell into the ductwork. These dampers open and close to control the airflow to every part of the home. Now on the ground floor, we did something really special with the floor joists on the floor above us. We ran duct work that's not the traditional large duct. We worked with a company called Unico. We've got Steve and Tagliata with us today to explain it. Hey, Michael, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Now, normally when you carry a piece of duct work, it's like this. Correct. Your arm. Now, you've got this. Tell me about it. Why is it smaller and how does it work? It, uh, it's smaller. It's a two-inch diameter tube, three and a half on the outside. Uh, Unico is a mini duct high velocity pressurized system which means that we're pressurizing the duct and our velocities are higher in our duct work. So you're pushing more air through a smaller duct. Correct. Okay, and Correct. why do you do that? To generate more aspiration into the room, to give the room more even air temperature. Okay. And because we remove 30% more humidity than the conventional system. Great. Which Great. allows us to dry the air out and have a higher thermostat setting, saving energy. Okay, so we're going to save money and it's going to feel more comfortable. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the duct work, uh, do you use more of them in a room than yes. you would with the traditional? Yes, in a room duct? this size, typically 14 by 14, we'll have two, three, maybe four outlets depending on its exposure. And I guess since it's smaller, it's got to be a lot easier to install, like our floor joists above us. Right. It's yeah. easier to go into the floor joists than they can drill those, carry the tube out to the termination point. Yes. And carry it into any wall? Any outside wall, interior, yeah. whatever they can do. And I guess since it's so small, we're not going to have to fur out some big places for it. If right. We're up in the corner of our bedroom or up against where the wall hits the ceiling. Right. As we showed in this room, it's in the joy space. So yeah. it's hidden. It's out of the way. Good. So we're not taking up space. And then you talked about the termination point or where we'd see traditionally a grill. Mm -hmm. And you use something a little different here? Yeah. This is our finished termination grill. Uh, this is it. This is all you'll see in the ceiling. Okay. So it's not obtrusive. It's not the big... Correct. Anyway, it's not a big see. rectangular metal grill. It's a very small. It's hidden in the corners. Yeah. Once the ceiling's in, painted white, this blends right in. That's great. So we're going to have a consistent room temperature, and it's going to be really quiet. Yes, sir. So I like that. Let's go up and take a look at the air handler up in the attic. I want to see how this comes together. Let's go. Okay. Steve, tell me how the unit goes together. Well, our units are modular, which means the blower section separate from the heating section, which is separate from the evaporator coil. 
They have shiplap fittings at the bottom, so they connect together down there, and then at the top, it's completely gasketed, and we call them suitcase latches. Yeah. And you latch it, and then it's airtight. Really easy to install. Very, then, very simple, yes, yeah. sir. I noticed it's real clean up in the attic. I mean, we've got one main trunk line running around the house with a lot of feeder lines going off of it. Correct. Yeah, yeah. the two-inch tubes going into termination points, yes, sir. That's got to be easier on the HVAC guys to install. Than Much it is. simpler. They don't have to transition down to different size ducts. They can run one main trunk line and then take the two-inch tubes off of that. Yeah. It really looks clean for an attic. Yep. Tell me about the furnace system. Unico has hot water heating capabilities, electric strip heat, and heat pump. Those okay. are our three sources of heating. So really anything we want to do? Yes, sir. And we're going to save money on our utility bills, and it's going to be comfortable in every room. Yes, sir. I like it. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Michael. It's time to insulate the project house and we've decided to go with a state-of-the-art soft foam system that you have to see to believe. When it expands and hardens, this foam will insulate our house against heat, cold, and sound. It also acts as a complete barrier to air infiltration, which can account for up to 40% of the heat loss or gain in the average home. And since we have 16,000 square feet in our project house to heat and cool, we want it to be extremely energy efficient. We've got Sean Ripon here to help us today from Isonine. And Sean, thanks for joining us. And explain to me how this foam works. Well, the Isonine insulation system starts off as two separate components from 55 gallon drums. There's an A and a B. The products are heated up and sent through a hose and then meet at the tip of a gun. And that's really where the magic starts mm -hmm. because the product is applied as a liquid and then expands 100 times its volume in just eight seconds, thereby giving you not only insulation, but an effective air barrier as well. So it looks like you're spraying it on like paint, so it goes everywhere in our wall cavity and then just expands 100 times, you said just right then. Yes, we want to make sure that it expands into all the cracks, holes, any seams that may be in the building envelope to ensure that we get a nice, tight air barrier. So any penetrations we have in the wall, like where we have a faucet outside coming in or maybe a dryer vent, that's all going to be sealed up. Yes, and that's important to ensure that you have the energy efficiency that we're looking for in this home. What kind of energy savings can we expect by not having any air infiltration whatsoever in the walls? Well, typically we can reduce the energy consumption for heating and cooling between 30 and 50%. And that's becoming a significant number as energy prices increase over time. That's a lot of money on our bills, and I guess our HVAC equipment is going to last longer too, then it's not going to run as often as hard. Yeah. By keeping the conditioned air inside the building envelope, we're actually allowing the HVAC system to be downsized because you're not having to make up for the air that is escaping to the outside. So we can save some money there also? Yes. Okay. Now once it's in, uh, it's kind of sticking out and it's over our studs, so I'm sure the drywall guys are upset with you. <laughs> well, what do you do at this point? Well, our installer, Donnie Biker, will be coming back uh, shortly, and what he'll do is he'll scarf back the foam so that it's flush with the cavity. And when you say scarf back, he's going to put a blade on both sides and run it across? Yes. And what do you do with the excess? Uh, it's ground up and then we'll put it into the attic application. Uh, some of our installers have agreements with shipping companies and they use it as packaging material. Okay, so there's no waste once we're done with the no. project. Okay. Now it fills in everything a lot tighter than, let's say, uh, some other types of insulation. but. How does it stay on the wood? I mean, the home's going to expand and contract. What happens with the foam? Right. Well, part of the uh, secret with the icing and insulation system is it remains soft, not only when it's installed, but it'll remain soft over time. And that we know that this building is going to expand and contract, and we want the insulation and the air seal to move with it. And it is tenaciously uh, adhesive. And that I've pulled this away from the wall, but you can see that a small uh, residue has remained behind. And in actual fact, there is no chemical that we know of that will remove that from the building substrate. It's stuck. It's there for <laughs> okay. good. Okay, good. How about as far as sound? I mean, that's a lot of foam there. It, it ought to help as well, shouldn't it? Definitely. What we've done in this particular cavity is that we have a water drainage pipe here. And here you can see how it's foamed around the pipe, totally encapsulating it. And this is going to reduce the sound transmission into the living space. And as you can see up here above, we also have numerous insulation challenges and that we want to get around the wiring as well as that drain pipe. Okay, but someone flushes a toilet or runs a shower up there, we're not going to hear it in the walls. Running no, and there. I don't think anybody does. <laughs> okay, that's good. I like that. Now we're talking about the walls, but we've also got some places overhead that we need to foam over in the garage. Let's go take a look. Great. 
Well, Sean, the reason we asked to insulate the garage is we are putting a woodworking shop in here, but what I'm really concerned about is the living space above us. How does isonine function in the garage? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to spray isonine right on to the roof deck here. It's going to adhere and expand and fill the cavity. You don't have to worry about it coming off, falling down due to gravity. It's going to stay in there today, tomorrow, and 20 years from now. And we want to do that because we want to mitigate any sound transmission from this area up into the living space. We also want to make sure that the air from in here doesn't migrate upstairs. That's from a comfort factor. But also, if there's any fumes or chemicals that are being used down here, we don't want that to migrate up into the living space as well. That's great. I, I love the idea of having it up there. How about air and moisture and mold and mildew and that type of thing? How does isonine affect that? Well, as being an insulation and an air barrier, what we're doing is reducing air infiltration into the building envelope. And we are interested in that because air transports moisture, hot, humid air, from outside into the building envelope. When that hot, humid air hits the cooler interior air, it releases the moisture through condensation, and with that moisture comes all sorts of problems, such as mold. Okay, so no mold. We're going to cut down on our allergies and everything like that. We're doing everything we can. Sean, thanks for all the help. Thank you. It's going to take several tons of synthetic gypsum wallboard to cover the walls of our 16,000 square foot project house. That's well over a thousand of these 4x10 and 4x12 foot sheets. Once the wallboard was distributed, the installation crew got to work. There's an art to working with wallboard, which is also known as drywall. In many places, the board must be measured, then scored and cut to fit. Rough edges are smoothed off with a planer. After marking the location of a light fixture, the crew nails the board to the studs. Then the installer uses a rotary cutter to cut the opening for the fixture. Finally, the wallboard is screwed down tightly using a screw gun. The process is repeated throughout the house. Board is placed over doorways and arches. Then openings are cut out. Cuts are made for electrical outlets, light switches, air intakes, and even fireplaces. Then there are special treatments like barreled ceilings that require special quarter inch board that is prepared with water. The board is bent in stages, a little at a time. The workers then push the board into the arch to secure the wall board to the support boards. Once all the board is cut to fit and secured to the walls, the taping and bedding begins. Working on stilts to gain height where they need to, the installers tape the seams where the gypsum boards meet. After the seams are covered with tape, the workers come back and apply a thin layer of drywall mud to ensure a smooth and visible transition between the adjoining pieces of wallboard. Now one of the things that's really unique about the drywall we're using in the project house is it's recycled, 95% recycled. It's actually synthetic gypsum. To explain more, I've got Stephen Rayleigh here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Now tell me, how do you make synthetic gypsum? I'm used to it always being mined right out of the ground, but sure, this isn't done that way. What do you do? Basically what happens is coal burning power plants inject a water limestone slurry into their smokestack to take out all the sulfur dioxide. So what happens is when the sulfur dioxide is coming up the smokestack, it mixes with the water limestone slurry and under oxidation it forms synthetic gypsum. We actually built the synthetic gypsum from the power plant over into our facility. And what we do there is we add water and other additives back into the mixture, which we call stucco, and it is laid out on paper, and then another piece of paper comes in on top of it. It's dried under high heat, and then as it comes out, we cut it to length, and then we actually book match it together. So there's actually two pieces in one bundle, and then we intake the ends, and then it's ready for shipment. And the gypsum is synthetic. How about the paper? The paper is also 100% recycled as well. So if we weren't using 100% recycled product, this would probably end up in a landfill as well as the synthetic gypsum. So both products would have been in the landfill. That's right. Okay, That's now we're, right. We're using a lot of different types and sizes inside the project house. We've got the 5 8 inch drywall up on our ceilings. And then we have the half inch on our walls. And then this thin stuff, the quarter inch, we're actually using 
to make our arches. And we've got a lot of arches here in the project house throughout the home, so it really bends nice. But tell me about the green board. We're using that in all the wet areas, and I don't think people really understand why this is so good to use in bathrooms. Michael, the green board is actually treated, the paper is treated with a water resistant formula. And then we also do something different to the core of the product that also makes it water resistant as well. So it's great to use this in high humid water type areas, bathrooms, etc. So our walls are not going to turn yellow in any of those areas from steam coming out of the showers and tubs and things? That is correct. Yeah. Now tell me about this piece of drywall that we're setting all of our props on because it's 12 feet long and I've seen a lot of 12 feet long drywall. But this thing is really wide. How wide is this? This is 54 inch wide by 12 feet long. And what you have here is a piece of 54 inch board that's used for nine foot ceilings. So you can take two pieces of 54 inch board, hang them horizontally, one on top of the other, and therefore you don't have the 12 inch strip at the top from using traditionally 48 inch wall board. Now you got a knife there. How does it cut compared to normal gypsum? Synthetic gypsum is much more pure than mine gypsum. And as you can see here, cut a curve for us there. Wow, that is a clean edge. Yeah, you don't normally see a piece of drywall cut that smooth. Synthetic gypsum, like I said, is much pure. It's much more consistent than mine gypsum. The drywall hangers love it. Yeah, well, I like it too. Hey, thanks for joining us today, Steve. Thank you, Michael. Well, if you've been following this series, you know we're doing a lot of exciting things on the project house. We have a tornado resistant roof, we have foam insulation in the walls, and we have the ultimate in home automation systems. But we also want the house to be very accessible. We've got oversized doors and entryways throughout the whole house because we want to be able to put a wheelchair anywhere in the home. We're doing something really special though behind this door. Press a button, open it up. We actually have an elevator built inside the house. To explain a little bit more about it, we've got Tom Hans here from Access Industries. Thanks for joining Mike, us. How you doing? Good, good. Tell us about elevators and why we're seeing more and more of those in new construction now. Well, demographically, elevators are becoming popular because houses we know are becoming larger, higher, multi-story. A lot of people like to buy elevators today or houses and live there till they die yeah. and pass away. So the elevator allows them to do that. A lot of people are having in-laws or uh, Moms and dads. generation families spend, spend with them also, yes. That makes sense, yeah. How hard is it to put an elevator inside a house? I don't see a big equipment room with a lot of hydraulics or anything around this elevator. Uh, access leads in this area because of that. Um, if you notice below, there is no pit, and that's a rarity in an elevator. Now, the other thing is we have no machine room, and most of our competitors do have machine rooms because they're hydraulics. This is not a hydraulic elevator. Um, so it's very easy to install in two days, two men. And um, we hope our goal is to become a commodity type product like a dishwasher or a Just going to find it in every home that's every two stores? Home. Um, in fact, the value of this elevator is going to houses that are now in a quarter million dollar range. Um, so it's coming at a very, very low price point. That's good. Well, it doesn't take up much room throughout our house. I mean, it looks like a big closet, really. In so fact, that's what it is. In fact, uh, you really can install this elevator in multiple closets that are above each other. So it's very nice and very easy to install. So we're really not going to be limited to new construction. I mean, in the future, we could actually retrofit this inside existing two-story homes. If you have a house today that has a, um, a closet above a closet, you could install this elevator in there today. Well, take me through the two-day process on how to actually install the elevator. Uh, normally, the shaftway is pre-built by the contractor. Uh, we come in and install um, the I-beams, or the carriage it rides on. Uh, we install a counterweight system. After that's installed, um, we install the motor at the top of the shaftway, which drives the counterweights, um, uh, which is tied to a chain. The uh, chain goes through a motor drive. We attach the floor first, then piece by piece we put the walls on. Uh, we finally put the top on with the lights. The electronics are behind the last panel. Sign the panel in place. You got it? Yeah. And you're ready to go. Yeah. Well, it even looks good. That's a great wood interior. Let's go ahead and ride it on up to the second floor. Okay, very good. The trolls look just like a commercial elevator. Not very much so. In fact, uh, down here, as you've seen, most elevators, we have a phone. And a phone can be used to call anywhere. Wow. That's, That's great. a nice, nice feature. 
great elevator. Uh, kind of tight when you put a camera crew inside it. Very much. <laughs> but uh, these finishes come in different options. Uh, raised panels, this we you guys here. We have cherry, we have uh, laminate. Um, we have brass here for this also. Yeah. What we have here is a key switch which you can activate uh, to disallow the elevator from moving in case you have kids or relatives over you don't want them using the elevator. No music? No, no music yet. <laughs> and then we have two doors that we're opening and closing here and your controls. How does this setup work? Uh, the most important feature here is this. Uh, this allows, inner lock allows you not to open this door here when the elevator is not there. Okay, so we'll never step out into the no. shaft. And also this sliding glass door here has to be closed before the elevator can move, obviously, so you're safe there. Um, another thing we've done also, which is a safety feature, if you lose power, batteries uh, will back it up, and the elevator can only go down, but allows you to go to the lowest floor and get out in case of problems. So from a safety standpoint, it's 100% secure. I love it. Well, I appreciate all the help. Oh, Thanks. Very good. Anytime. Now all of the interior doors in the house are solid one-piece doors made out of medium density fiberboard or MDF from Willamette Industries. And the door is actually manufactured by Belection and we're lucky enough to have Robert Stewart with us today from Belection. Hey Robert. Hey Michael, nice to be here. Thanks for joining us. Explain to me a little bit about uh, medium density fiberboard and why you chose that instead of a solid wood door. Well medium density fiberboard is basically made from sawmill waste. They take chips and uh, planar shavings and they manufacture the board out of it. So we're not cutting down any trees to no, make this door? No, it's typically made just from sawmill waste. Yeah. What we like about it in our production is that it, it's a very uniform material and allows us to infinite design flexibility in our product. Okay, now behind you we have a solid wood door, standard six panel door. Right. Explain to us a little bit about the anatomy of a door and the pieces okay. that make it up. A typical door is made up of, of various components. You've got the styles on the outside of the door, the vertical components. You've got mullions in the center, vertical components. You've got rails, which are horizontal components. And you've got panels. And they'll be different depending upon the type layout of the door. Okay, now why did you decide not to go with the solid wood door? Well, one of the big problems with a standard made door, style rail door is that because of changes in humidity that occur in every house, you're going to have movement between this panel, which is these components are glued together, this is left floating. And in the winter, you'll see lines, and, and often in the summer as well, you can get this panel moving from your rail. It'll pull out from there and right. from the mullein in there and stuff. I had a library with a stained door and it got a crack down sure. through on the panel. So just moisture changes, heat changes, right. woods expanding and contracting. With this product, we're able to manufacture many different designs. And because it is all one piece, the panel and the rails and the styles are all together. You're never going to have that separation. It's a paint and forget product. Paint and forget, I like that. We're going to paint it one time. Right. We're never going to worry about it again. Right. Another version of the doors in the house would be this combination, which shows the arch top panels like you have, yeah. but combine as well an arch top rail, where in a double door application makes a very elegant opening. Yeah. And Michael, one of the unique features of our doors is the fact that we square all our 90 degree corners, even though it's manufactured in a milling machine. And then how about as far as price? Now this is a big door. Uh, if we got this in solid wood instead of the medium density fiberboard and we had separate panels and everything, how would the cost compare? Well, especially when you get to complicated doors with curves and yeah. circles and, and things like that, this is going to be much, much more price competitive than you would get in a style and rail type door. Okay, so good price. We're not going to cut down any trees to manufacture right. it or anything like that. And we can do any style that we want. Exactly. I like that a lot. Now in the other room, I know we we're supposed to saw some doors in half. Let's go take a look. Sure, at great. Okay. Now Robert, someone's already cut our medium density fiberboard right. door open and it's obvious to see from this angle that it is just one solid piece, isn't it? Right, like I said, it's just all out of one sheet so that there are no separate components to the door itself. So we're never going to pull apart? Never. Never going to have a problem with paint or stain or anything like Not that? Not at all. Now we talked about the medium density fiberboard door, we talked about the solid wood right. door, but most of America has this. Yeah, this hollow core. Very, very light. Let me pick it up. The difference in this type of door is that it is hollow. They've taken a molded skin and laminated it between some cardboard in the center. Cardboard? Right. Okay. Well, we said we were going to cut some doors open, so let's go ahead and fire up the saw and cut right through this door. Ooh. 
really not much there in the way of door, is there, Robert? I mean, just a few pieces of right. cardboard in the center. Right. That's really all we have, and you, you, you squeeze it. You don't get any sound deadening properties from this type of door. Uh, it's very lightweight. Uh, doesn't close very well. If you compare it to a to one of uh, this a solid door like this, yeah. there's just no really no comparison. Yeah, none whatsoever. You could put your fist right through this door, couldn't you? Right, it happens. And yeah. With the solid constructed door like this, you can never do that. What we really want is to make sure that we get a solid one piece door, but we want it to be a solid one piece exactly. door. Exactly, exactly. Go ahead and make sure that it's medium density fiberboard, it won't pull apart, crack, won't have a problem with it. You will never have a problem with a door like this. Yeah, well Robert, thanks for all the help with the doors. My pleasure being here. We've just put the doors up inside the project house. Now we're ready to add some molding. Molding can really add a luxurious touch to your new house or even an existing house at a very reasonable price. Now in our project house, the majority of our molding is actually made by a company called Pack Trim, which is owned by Pacific MDF. And it's material that's actually medium density fiberboard or commonly known as MDF. It comes from Willamette Industries. Now it looks like a board, but if you get in really tight, you can see that it's a lot of wood fibers that have actually been pressed together with heat and glue to make a very straight piece. Now the molding needs to be straight. We don't want any warps or cracks because this is the part that you really see. This is what sets off the house. Normally we talk about strength and holding up against strong winds, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes. This is for pleasure. This is the look of your house. We want it to be super straight. You can look right down there. We have no curve or anything. With the MDF, we're not going to see it warp, crack, anything like that. So this is great to use for trim. This is just a square board, but you can really cut it into any shape or profile. This is a piece of base trim. You turn it sideways, you can see the profile they've cut into it. Now the good part is this is never going to change. Once we put the paint on it, we're done with it. Up here we have a piece of crown molding or cornice work that we can use. Again, a very different profile. And if you look across the table, you can see there's really just any shape or look that you want you can do with this MDF. Over the last 10 years, crown molding has become really popular again, and you see it in new homes everywhere across the country. Here we've got a few different samples. Where our ceiling pops up, we've got a one-step piece of crown molding. That means it's one piece of material that the trim carpenters nailed in place there. And you use the crown molding to really break up your corners where you've got your wall hitting your ceiling. So in our pop-up, we just use the one piece. Here on our main wall, where it comes up, it is so tall inside this room that they went with two steps, or actually two pieces. So the trim carpenters came around, they nailed up one section, and then they came back and they nailed another section up there. The reason for that is to give it some height. Our wall is so high, we need it to be a little deeper or else it's gonna look kinda rinky-dink if we have it too small. So we use the one step where we just have a short pop-up. We use the two step where we have a very tall wall. And you can go three, four, five, depending on whatever your budget can handle. You can really make that quite detailed and get it really tall. But you don't want it too tall on a short wall and you don't want it too short on a tall wall. Now the way that Pacific MDF made that was they just took that medium density fiberboard, put it in a machine and they actually cut it and they just cut the profile that they wanted for the crown molding right out of the board. So you can really cut any shape that you're after like we talked about earlier. When you nail the pieces together, you actually nail them on place in the wall but here we made a little sample. This would be for a very tall wall. Let's say maybe we've got a 14 foot ceiling. Here we have one piece, so that's one step. Here we have our second step. And then the last one they nailed in place was this third step. So what we're actually gonna see up there on the wall against the ceiling is like so, but it's three pieces. Now again, on a wall that's eight feet high, this would look ridiculous. But if you got something 12, 14, 16 feet tall, you're gonna need a big piece of crown molding or it will look too small. No matter what price home that you're building or you live in, you're going to find base mold. On a home this big with this expense, you normally see maybe a two-step base mold there. You'll have a piece of MDF, and then you come back and you cap it with a piece of wood trim to give it some detail. From the side, the profile looks like this. Now, we didn't do that. Working with pack trim, we've actually got a piece that has that profile already cut into it, so we don't have to come back and add a second step. Now, not only does it look the same, it's very easy to mount because it's only one step. So we're gonna save some money. We don't have to pay for the labor to come in twice and put the first piece and then the second piece. Now, if you like molding that looks like it's a solid piece of metal, but you don't have that solid metal price tag, you can now achieve that. 
Here we have molding that's actually made out of polyurethane by a company known as Style Solutions. When you flip it over, it actually has a metal finish, or at least 95% metal finish, made by Metallon. And you can really achieve any look that you want, any profile, any shape, and any finish. Here we have a sample that's brass. Here we have copper with patina, copper, and over here we've got a bronze. They also do nickel and pewter and a lot of different finishes. We use this down in the kitchen because the interior part of our windows are all going to have a copper finish, so we're going with copper molding. The thing to really remember about molding is you have a lot of choices, whether it's your base down against the floor or whether it's your crown molding up against the ceiling. Remember your heights and how deep you need to go to make it look appropriate, colors to choose from, profiles, and always remember MDF is a good choice. Very inexpensive to use, it's environmentally friendly, you can cut any profile or shape, very easy to install, you paint it and you're done. Well, just like the rest of our project house, we didn't want to skimp when it came to our garage doors. We didn't want an ugly door on a beautiful home, so we did some really special stuff. We've got a lot of doors on this house, two over here, we've got three across the area here, and then actually we have one on the back side of that garage slot because you can pull all the way through the house. As you can see, they are beautiful doors. We actually worked with designer doors, and we're fortunate enough to have the founder of the company with us today, Kent Forslund. Kent, thanks for joining us. And you're actually the cause of all these designer door concepts all around the country. I mean, you came up with making doors different. How come? What happened? Well, what happened, Michael, is a uh, client of ours came and they had a carriage door that actually rolled on a track around the corner of their garage. And she wanted the door to go up like a regular garage door, but she wanted that look. Well, you've done it here for us on these doors. I mean, we've got a split down the door where it looks like it's actually a carriage door that's going to open up both ways and you've got all the different panels in there, custom windows it looks like. Right, in this example, in this door, we have two over two windows. So what you're seeing are four groupings of two over two windows. And often what is done in planning a home is picking up on window detail that is then carried elsewhere through the home. The other thing that we have is quite typical of a carriage door. We use some wood buttons and the wood buttons are somewhat mimicking the idea of a wood peg going back to when there wasn't actually fasteners yeah. and people used wood pegs for holding the boards on the door. We uh, also do one coat of finish usually before it goes out. You can see over here that we have started doing a second coat of finish just to show the richness of the wood. Yeah. And what type of wood have we got here? Well, this is Western Red Cedar on the outside. That's typically what we build our doors from. Okay. Uh, Western Red has a special chemical in it that keeps the insects from wanting to eat it up okay. and it helps reduce rotting. Very Let's nice. go inside and look at the back side. I want to see how you actually put something this big together. Okay. That is a solid looking door from the inside, Ken. All that hardware, solid wood too. Here you got a sample. Yes, this sample uh, allows us to show how the door is constructed. The interior of the door is made of a structural wood called Douglas fir. That's going to be strong, isn't it? Douglas fir is extremely strong. It has a real high sap content that uh, really helps it withstand rotting and, and other uh, decay. The uh, other thing about Douglas fir is that it is so rigid that it allows us to offer a hurricane package where we have the only door that will go up to 140 mile an hour wind load for a hurricane. The only wind door that can take that kind of wind load. Right. The Douglas fir is actually creating a structure for the window area. And the back of the window is finished. It's all true divided windows. A real divided light window. Right. Okay. And on the outside we have a 10 degree bevel on this cedar trim board to allow the water to shed away from the window area. And strong materials it looks like. Right, a lot of the hardware we use is such high quality that it's uh, built just for our specification. Some of the brackets and so on are built just for us. Okay, since everything's so custom, what do you do as far as installation? I mean, the builder buys direct, so who ins actually installs this door? The installation of the product is done by a network of certified installers. In this case, we used a local company, Nortex Overhead Garage Door. They did an excellent job, as all of our certified installers do. And then how do they actually put it together? I mean, does it stack like a normal garage door? Right. Each of the doors are labeled on the end of the section 
to indicate which sections go together. So the bottom section is put in first and it's leveled, and then all the sections above that are exactly lined up before the lagging is, is put in the back of the door. They're beautiful doors. They look great on the project house. Thank you, Thank Ken. You, Mike. When it comes to putting together a stunning home interior, nothing matches the beauty, style, and durability of natural wood floors. And that's why we've installed wood flooring in the common areas of the project house. We actually have over 6,000 square feet of hardwood floor between the first and second floor of our project house. But it's not an ordinary solid hardwood floor, it's actually an engineered wood floor. And to explain more, we've got John Himes with us today from Mannington Mills. And John, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, thanks for having us out, Michael. Hey, tell us about some of the advantages of going with engineered wood for a floor instead of a solid. When you look at an engineered piece of wood flooring, what you'll actually see is multiple plies of wood that are glued together in a cross grain construction which provides a much more stable platform than a solid wood floor which can warp or twist or buckle over time. And where can you install an engineered wood floor? That's one of the greatest things about it and what has really led to uh, their popularity is you can install them in a variety of areas almost anywhere in the house from uh, below grade to on grade as well as suspended subfloors. Okay, below grade would be the basement. Right. So even on a concrete like that, we can go down there where Absol it might be moisture. As long as there's no visible standing moisture on there, we're going to use a moisture cure urethane that actually gets stronger with a little bit of moisture from the slab. How did the guys install? What were the steps to put in an end in here? Well, really what Terry Fitzpatrick and his team did was they had to get their bearings. So they pop a bunch of chalk lines because what you got to do is stay very straight and square in an installation this big. So they put down a lot of chalk lines and then they work from quadrant to quadrant. You have about an hour once you start spreading the moisture cure urethane till it sets up. So what they did is they come in, they put in the quadrants and then they start spreading the adhesive and then they come back and start randomly staggering the planks out so that you get a nice random visual as you're looking at the floor. And as they do that they get them nice and tight tape them so that they stay right where they are at the time of installation and just keep working from quadrant to quadrant within those chalk lines that they've put down. And what did Terry and the guys do upstairs as far as putting the floor down? Because here we have concrete, but there we're on top of wood. What you do on a, on a wood subfloor or suspended subfloor is you can actually use a nail or a staple. And upstairs we actually use staples that look a lot like this. And we use a gun called the Floor Monster. And what that does is you actually hit about every four inches on the groove so that it drives those staples in and creates a very solid feeling underfoot. Yeah, I think in a tornado, the only thing that would stay together might be that floor. It, should, every do, four it should do very, very well. Yeah. Well, the floor does look beautiful, and I love the color, but I know there's a lot of choices. So let's go take a look in the other room. That sounds great. Okay. Well, John, it definitely looks like a lot of choices. There are a ton of choices, and, I, and uh, as we look at all of these wide varieties, the first thing you want to do is look at the finish, because finish technologies have really changed a ton in the last three years. When you look at factory applied finishes like we have. Three years, what's different? Well, typically three years ago, everybody was using a UV cured urethane finish, which gave you an excellent finish. But one of the challenge was the steel wool sort of emulates fast wear on a floor. And as you see, what you'd get in pivot points is you'd actually get intense wear near uh, dishwashers, refrigerators, etc. And what you get is microfine scratching that really tends to mess up the finish of the floor. Okay. And what we've done now is we actually have what's called scratch resist. And with scratch resist, you can do that same test and the particles that are suspended in that urethane basically ward off that microfine scratching. And our goal here is to essentially be able to make that wood floor look new much longer into the life of the house. Yeah, well, there's a huge difference. It's absolutely dramatic. There's also a variety of edge treatments, whether it's square edge like we have in the house today, mm -hmm. or a micro bevel that actually adds a bit of textural interest to the floor so that you can see that. Mm -hmm. A variety of options along those lines as well. And uh, the last thing, of course, is the, the plank width. Do you like a, a five inch visual or a typical three inch visual or even a two and a quarter like you have upstairs. It looks like distressed hardwood. Absolutely. This is actually distressing that we do in the plant that actually creates a wood look that emulates what would come out of a reclaimed building, a warehouse, etc. You get screw marks, saw marks, etc. 
so it looks like a solid wood plank. We have all the advantages of engineered wood. Absolute best of yeah. both worlds. Well, between the bevels, the width, the, the species of wood, and the colors, you have a lot of choices, don't you? Hundreds. You bet. Hundreds. Just what we needed. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Thanks, John. Hey, enjoyed it. Thanks so much. It's time to install the tile in the project house, and just like everything else in this 16,000 square foot home, we've gone out of our way to use innovative products and design ideas. In the bathrooms on the second floor, the crew prepares for tiling by installing a cement board underlayment. To secure the tile to the floor and to mix with the grout, we're using an innovative gel system from QEP. To prepare the thin set and the grout, the installers combine the proper gel with special sanded powder. Since this Q-Set gel system requires no mixing with water, we can be sure that every batch is uniform in color, consistency, and performance. The installer trials a smooth, even layer of thinset onto the cement board, and then it's time to lay the tile in a predetermined pattern. The installers use a wet saw to cut the pieces to fit. These saws are perfect for specialty cuts, like this 45-degree corner cut. A handheld grinder can be used for detail work, like cutting holes in the tile. Once the tiles are set, grout is applied, and the installation is complete. Now installation is critical, but just as important as picking the right design before you ever lay that first piece of tile. We've got a lot of different rooms in the project house and a lot of different patterns, and we had help from a company called Dow Tile. We have Lori Kirk Raleigh here to explain part of our design. Hi hey, there, Michael. Lori, thanks for joining us. Nice to be here. Now tell us about this bathroom. This is not ordinary. We've got 12 inch tiles on the floor, and then you ran them right up the wall. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, what we did here is we took a floor tile in a 12 inch size, and we actually use it as a design element on the wall. So you can see what we did, we went halfway up the wainscot here, mm -hmm. we separated by an accent border, and then the rest of the way up we went with a six by six tile, peppered with fleur-de-lis accents, finished off by a resin accent tile and an accent border. These particular accents were designed to work with the tile, and you can see here they're highly decorative, and this particular chair rail piece, also highly decorative, provides a nice transition regardless of if you put paint or if you put wallpaper. We could go either way with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Now over here you have some really big tile. Explain to me how popular is that nowadays. One of the trends that we see in the marketplace today is the use of larger size tiles. Many people think that if you have a small size room, you need to use a smaller tile, but the reality is if you use a larger tile, it actually creates less grout joints, which can open up a room and make it look bigger. So we're going to break the old theory of small room, small tile, big rooms, big tile. Absolutely. Okay. Let's go check out another room here in the house. Very good. Well, Lori, this doesn't look like ceramic tile. This actually looks like natural stone. Well, actually, this product, Michael, was designed to look just like what's called tumbled natural stone. You can see here on the wall, we used a four and a quarter by four and a quarter size, which is a traditional size for a tumbled stone. And then we developed a border that is the same size that integrates little mosaic inserts for the wall. And this particular accent actually could also be used on the floor. Yeah, well, natural stone is very popular nowadays, so. I can see why you'd, you'd uh, make the tile look like stone. How about as far as price though? How does it compare? You know, um, it's interesting. Um, a ceramic that's made to look like a tumbled stone like this one could cost a homeowner about half the price of using actual tumbled stone. Half the price. Half <laughs> okay. the price. Yeah, it's a good reason to consider it. I, I like that quite a bit. But um, this particular product is also what we call a floor wall combination. And what that means is that the wall tile and all the elements were designed to coordinate with the floor. So it takes some of the guesswork out of the selection process for the homeowner. They can design with confidence knowing that the wall tile will coordinate with the floor. Well, we've been in some bathrooms, but we did more rooms than just the bathroom. Let's go take a look at the hobby room. Great. Well, for this particular application, because it's considered a high traffic area, we actually chose a porcelain tile. And um, the nature of the tile, again, it does look like a stone, which, which will help it to hide some of the dirt and some of the materials that may be spilled on it. Okay, we have some samples here. Explain to me the difference then between the porcelain tile and a normal ceramic tile. Well, in a porcelain tile, you have um, the color on the surface of the tile, but then you also have the color that goes through the entire body of the tile. So it looks like this all the way so through. So it looks like that all the way through. In contrast, a ceramic tile, you have the glazing and the different colors on the surface of the tile, and then um, the body of the tile is actually just the actual talc 
of the ceramic. So okay. the color doesn't go all the way through. Now tell me about this. This is beautiful. Well, what, is what this? this is, is this is um, a, a new product. It's actually a glass mosaic. You can see it has an iridescent surface. And if you flip it over, one of the characteristics of this is it's a dot mounted, so it makes it easier to install so that you're not installing little little mosaics one by one. And then I guess you could cut it really any width that you wanted to use it as borders or anything else. Absolutely, you? yeah. You could cut little squares to go in inserts in a design on the wall, or mm -hmm. you could cut it in strips so that it's used as an accent strip, again, to border um, to border a room. I love that, and it does look like glass. I really like the reflection. Tell me about this. This looks like metal. What well, have we got here? Well, actually, this is metal. Um, mm -hmm. What this is, this is another new product that uh, utilizes a, a metallic or metal on the surface. The the beauty of this tile, aside from the aesthetic, is that it won't tarnish over time. You can put it in wet areas and without a worry. There's a lot of um, different design ideas that you can execute with these products. A lot of great choices. Thank you. Thank you very much. They say that first impressions are everything, and we took that to heart when it came to the design of the front entryway of our project house. Now, this is no ordinary front entryway. This is glass and wrought iron as a work of art with matching gas lanterns. It all comes from a company called Solera Doors and Lanterns, and we're fortunate enough to have the president with us today, Alberto Perez from Solera. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us today. I look at this door and I go, wow, this is not something you ordinarily see. This is huge. Alberto, how big is this entryway? This entryway is about 19 feet high by 10 feet wide. And it's, uh, it combines the beauty of the side lights, doors, central panels, and transom. All this wrought iron that you see here is hand forged. Wrought iron has become in again, and it used to be very popular 100 years ago, but was basically used in castles and churches and big uh, buildings, but lately, and it started in Mexico about 15 years, 20 years ago, we started using it as a front entrance in regular residences. Mm -hmm. Rather than making an ordinary front door, we're trying to build a magnificent entrance just like this one. Well, I mean, it really captures your attention when you pull up to the house. This is the centerpiece right here. And then I guess the door has some other advantages over wood also, doesn't it, being made out of wrought iron? That's exactly right. Compared to wood, the height that you can play on these doors yeah. is one important benefit. The other thing is that it really passed the test of time. I mean, some of these doors have been there for hundreds of years, and the durability and the beauty is, is uh, timeless. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't warp, it doesn't wear out, it doesn't crack. It provides excellent security. Well, let's go inside and take a look from the other side. Let's go. Wow, for as big as this is, that feels light. That thing really swings, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, the ball bearing hinges help a lot. Ball bearing hinges, so it's yes. rolling on the ball bearing. That's right. This particular door has five pairs, and that, that really makes the door to feel light and easily open. Yeah. Alberto, I had that cleaning question, though, on the inside. You've got a lot of glass here that the wrought iron's in front of, so how do you get the glass clean from the outside? Well, back in the old days, it would be very difficult because the glass was fixed, mm -hmm. so you have to go around the wrought iron trying to clean the glass. So in this particular case, since we start manufacturing the doors, we introduce the glass panel that's operable and swings in, so you can easily clean it and also leave it open during the good days for ventilation purposes. Okay, so we can get a breeze, but we still have our security because of the wrought iron. That's another beautiful feature about these doors. Yeah. So you can talk to the person outside yeah. without unlocking the door, just keeping the glass open. Yeah, and double pane insulated glass, I can feel there. And every single piece does that then, doesn't it? They all pull out? Right. Now, on the door, when we walked in, the one thing that caught my attention was no door knob. You just pull it open. Tell me about that. This door was prepared for just a wrought iron pull handle with a dead bolt. Well, that's great. Hey, before you leave, though, I want to see that gas lantern outside. Let's go take a look real quick. Thank you. Well, I love gas lamps. They look great. And that one just looks awesome. It's really nice. Here we have a model. And this particular one I would like to show you, it's a... Uh, this technology allows you to basically have the safety and the convenience and you have this, the automatic shut off valve with the electronic system and a photo cell so it turns on and off by itself day and night. Also, if for whatever reason the flame turns off, I mean if you want to just blow the flame out. Starts right back up. Starts right back. That's great. So yeah. if it's a windy day we're not going to have a problem and it shuts itself on and off at night in the morning. 
That's exactly right. Energy efficient. So old world look with brand new technology. I love it. Thanks for all your work. It looks great. Thank you very much to you, Michael. Today we're going to show you how we took the backyard of our project house and transformed it into a stunning outdoor environment that looks like this. Victor Mueller of Anthony and Sylvan Pools designed the pool area and oversaw the construction. Well, Victor, this is unbelievable how good looking it is. I mean, a beautiful deck, you got your natural waterfall feature here with your rock, pool even has a beach. And over here, we've got our spa going. This is really something else. How do you even start a project like this? Well, it all starts with a plan. So we need 8-1 and 18 three. Three. We began uh, by coming out to the home while the home was in its early stages of construction and coming up with a design that would not only complement the large, beautiful home, but I wanted the pool to take on a, uh, an environment and a look all its own. We start by actually spray painting the design of the pool on the ground using a transit to determine the elevation of the pool and show the excavator what he has to grade down to before he actually starts digging the hole. In this case, uh, we also had to remove a very large tree stump to get it out of the pool site. The excavator just digs the hole to the specifications that we designed on this particular custom pool. Once the hole is excavated, our steel crew comes in and hand bends all the steel rods to reinforce the shell. And we use a, a four bar box beam at the top one foot of the pool for reinforcing. This maximizes the strength of the pool. Once the steel's installed, then our plumbers come in and lays all the pipe for the pool. We've got uh, points of suction and points of return. The hot tub has to be plumbed in with all the jets and uh, all of the equipment is then also set, the pumps, the filters, and that sort of thing. Once the plumbing crew is finished, we're ready for gunite. The gunite is a process of blowing under high pressure a concrete mixture right over the steel that creates the shell of the pool. The floors, the walls, the steps, uh, the love seats, and all of this is, is hand sculpted. It's like uh, master sandcastle builders with trials. Once the gunite shell is complete, we're ready for the electrician to come in and hook up all of this equipment that the plumber set, setting the computer controls, the pumps are wired in, then we're ready for the next phase. Now we're going to start to beautify the pool by adding coping to dress the top of the beam. In this case, we chose a, an Austin stone, which is basically a white color that I chose to enhance the, the white trim on the house, actually. We also did this around the top of the spa, and then we dressed the outside of the raised spa with Austin chopstone. Now we're ready for the next phase, which is the decking. In this case, we installed 2,000 square feet of brushed concrete as a base. This concrete decking was hand sloped into the deck drains to carry out all the rainwater so we wouldn't have any standing water around the pool. We also tied in a gutter downspouts from the house. Our steps were installed with the same Austin flagstone that went around the pool. Each stone, and we used several tons of stone, each stone was hand chipped, leveled, and placed and went right from the existing patio down to the pool area, and this gave a real formal transition from the house to the pool. Once the walls and steps were done, we were ready to top the decking. That was done by pouring a base coat over the existing patios to adhere to the concrete. Once that was done, we hand taped off a design that looked like random rectangles. The texture coat was then applied with trowels and stamped with a special rubber stamp that created impressions and the design of the deck. Once this texture coat dried, we pulled up the tape to create what now appears to be grout lines. Once that was done, we were able to stain the deck the color that you see now, which is a stone look that had darker impressions and, and lighter on the surface, gave it a nice texture. Once the decking was complete, we were ready to put the interior finish into the pool. We chose an aggregate finish for this pool to enhance the natural design of the pool and also complete the beach entry that leads you into the pool from the decking. They put the first coat on to cover up the rough surface of the gunite and then a second coat was applied to water seal the pool. The interior finish on the second coat is repressed and retrialed and rinsed several times until we get a nice smooth finish. This also reveals the natural look of the aggregate finish. 
The last step is to fill the pool with water and it's time to go swimming. I love this spa. I mean, you got a lot of jets in here, but I love this bench. How many people can you seat on this custom bench? Uh, 10 to 12 people can fit in here comfortably with the six jets and the full size spa light. And there's a step that leads you down into the spa. Uh, it's very comfortable for the whole family. Yeah, it looks comfortable. It looks, it sounds relaxing too. I love the sound coming over those waterfalls as well. Yeah, this was done to make it as natural looking as possible by putting uh, two rock waterfalls uh, connected together with the extra boulders and then also using additional boulders in front of the spa, we actually uh, brought in 12 points of water to cascade over this and really enhance the natural look. Yeah. The spa then spills into a, onto a, a tanning ledge where someone could lay there and get a suntan. And Still stay cool at the same time because cool they're in the water. Stay cool at the same time, right. Yeah. I love this entryway also, this beach entryway that actually slides into the pool just like a real beach. Yeah, this completes the natural look. It, it actually looks like a beach. It's got a texture like sand uh, and it just flows right into the pool so you can just walk in just like you're at the ocean. Well, it's definitely not an ordinary pool. It's no, definitely it's a backyard <laughs> environment. Thanks for all Thank the help, Victor. My pleasure. Thank you. There are 11 bathrooms in our 16,000 square foot project house. That's a lot of bathrooms by any standard. But it's also given us a lot of opportunities to explore the great options out there when it comes to tubs, toilets, faucets, and fixtures. Gary Yule of American Standard helped us design our bathrooms. One of the biggest changes in design in American homes is inside the bathroom, taking it from just a functional room into a really luxurious room, almost a sanctuary. We decided to do that in the project house, and Gary, thanks for joining us. Hi, Michael. Hey, it does feel like a sanctuary in here, and I'm really impressed with this shower. Let's start in there. Isn't this something? Gary, you guys designed a big shower. This thing is huge. This is a large shower, I must admit. Yeah. This is not typical. I like it. I also like the bench right when you first walk in. That's nice. Isn't that great? Uh, really helps for the disabled or anybody shaving legs, storing bottles. We've got a lot of different faucets and things inside of here. Large shower, we can do a lot of things. So we have multiple functions going on here. There's, of course, the, the rain shower head. The handheld shower, that's very useful for washing the body and a large shower space like this. Clean and we up. also have uh, side body sprays to help uh, fill the area with warm moisture and warm air. That are adjustable. How do you control everything now? Well, all of this is controlled from the thermostatic valve. And the thermostatic valve keeps the temperature constant between the hot and the cold. So we're going to have a constant stream, the same temperature. We're never going to have to jump out of the way. That's, That's correct. Way. Exactly. The, the old flushing the toilet thing that used to occur. So when you're in all this moisture and all this water, it keeps the same temperature. And this one set of controls, though, you're saying is all three units it will run off here. Correct. It's a large valve and, and is able to flow enough water to drive all of this. I love then. Let's go take a look at the bathtub. Okay. Well, Gary, I really like that the tub's up on the deck like this. This is nice. Isn't this great? Yeah, Whirlpool. Eight jets, it looks like. Yeah, eight jets. Uh, good things to look for in a Whirlpool. Uh, lumbar support and the placement of the jets. Okay. I like this also. Tell me about the handheld unit being with the bathtub. You normally don't see that. Isn't that great? It's a, it's a shower, a handheld shower, and when you're done bathing, you can rinse off. It's also very useful for keeping the whirlpool clean. I like that. I like that a lot. Easy to wash your hair. Correct. Let's take a look at the sinks over here. All right. Well, I love this sink and the detail that you got around the perimeter of it here. What is this called? Isn't this beautiful? This is our Bedminster sink. This is a rope detail around the front of the uh, sink. A rope detail. And how about over our overflow hole here? What is this? Well, we're covering the hole with a fig leaf pattern. It's, it's actually very traditional in sink design. Yeah, looks good. How, tell me about this thing behind you. What's this one for? Well, it's interesting. There, there's quite a range of choices that are available to the consumer today. And what you're seeing here is this is from our Porsche line of products. It is a hand decorated uh, sink. You can see the gold leaves that are hand done in and fired into the glaze. And that's sharp. And that's a drop-in sink, so I take it we're going to use it somewhere else in the house. This one's going elsewhere in the house. These are both drop-in sinks. And what other styles are you using inside the project house here? Well, this is such a large house, some of the bathrooms have pedestal sinks. Pedestal sinks usually go into a guest-type bathroom. They give you lots of area underneath for your feet. We also have console-type labs. That's where the bathroom sink is in itself, a whole table unit console in itself. Okay. And these are uh, good for individual bathrooms. Yeah. Well, I like all the different choices and selections. Tell me a little bit, though, about the faucets and fixtures here. What should we be looking for when we're picking these out for our bathroom? 
Well, this one is a, a dual finish of polished brass and satin nickel. The thing to look for is a PVD finish. This is a, a durable, rugged finish that holds up to cleaners and, and modern use. Okay, so you're not gonna scratch it up or wear it down. Correct. Okay, well, let's go take a look at the water closet also. we Will do. Well, Gary, we have both a toilet and a bidet inside this water closet. What should we be looking for when we're picking out the right toilet? There's a difference between elongated and round front. In the house here, we have the room. The elongated provides a more comfortable toilet. Round front is good when space is a consideration. Okay, so if we don't have as much room, a little smaller house, you might take a look at that. You might make that choice, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, let's go look at one other bathroom in the house before you leave. Okay. Gary, tell me about this claw foot tub. I have never seen anything like this before. This is our Calavary rain bath. It's a claw and ball tub and enclosed, glass enclosed shower. And look at the size of that rain head on top. I mean, that must feel like being in an actual rain. With it is, head. it's a gentle falling rain. Yeah, I like that a lot. You got a key shape to the tub, so there's plenty of room in the shower. It's not tight. It's designed to give you a good standing room and then a relaxing area for a soaking tub. Okay, and I see we've got our hand unit that we can pull out there. Sure, and easy to rinse off and then to keep it clean. Okay. Interesting thing about this tub, it's acrylic, so you get the warmth and the beautiful surface. And then outside, this is Eurocast. It has the strength of cast iron, but at half the weight. Well, thanks for all the help in the project house. Looks great. Great, Michael. My pleasure. Well, we're putting the finishing touches on the project house, which means we're installing the permanent furniture. I call cabinets permanent furniture because it's got that fine wood furniture finish, but it is permanent. We're not gonna move it around or change our minds later, so we really need to plan ahead. We're fortunate enough to be working with Tasha Burns from Armstrong Cabinets, and Tasha, thanks for joining us. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Huge kitchen. A lot of planning had to go into effect. What do Definitely. you have to think about? Things to consider would be whether or not you're gonna have one or more chefs in the kitchen, mm -hmm. uh, if you really enjoy cooking. Can a kitchen have more than one chef? Definitely, <laughs> okay. this one can, this can have several. <laughs> okay. Um, you wanna consider different work areas. You may want several if you have children or grandchildren visiting. Maybe you can have a special place for baking. Also think about uh, whether or not you buy food in bulk or small quantities, because mm -hmm. that will affect your storage space. Okay, well obviously you plan for this to be a big family in this house, because I mean, Turn around and look at this island. This thing is huge. It's incredible. Yeah, tell me about it. Well, this island allows for uh, lots of workspace, and we've got great opportunities with cabinets underneath here. Yeah, got a bread warmer here down below. Like cabinets this. above and below. Yeah, storage space everywhere. I like that a lot. It's and all of our drawers have the uh, extra depth and width Good. for large pots and pans. Okay. Great for storage. Big strainers, everything we can exactly. fit it in there. Now this is the sink side, so you wouldn't think there'd be a lot of storage on this side, but there's even storage here, isn't there? Yes, to the left and right we have spice racks, which is conveniently located across from the stove. I noticed today you have good use of the space even in the corner. Show me what you got yes. there. Yes. Great use of the space in the corner. I mean, we'll be able to reach everything with these Lazy Susans in here, won't we? These are wonderful because they maximize all of your space and it really personalizes your organization. Yeah, I like that a lot. Now I know a pantry is really a huge corner and you've maximized that. Let's go take a look over here. We've definitely gone overboard. Yeah, Tasha, I would say this is overboard. This is an unbelievable pantry. It's here. definitely a dream pantry. Yeah, I like, again, the use of all the storage space, Lazy Susans on top and on bottom both. I mean, we can get to everything, it's nice. We've got great counter space in here if you want to prepare some of your appetizer foods. You've got a sink in here, and the nice thing is you can make a mess and just walk away and close the door, and your guests won't <laughs> like see that. anything. I like that a lot, and I love how tall the cabinets are. I mean, all the storage space, you can put anything in this room. Lots can't you? of room for yeah. any type bulk foods, canned goods, uh, cleaning supplies. Yeah, and adjustable shelves. I noticed you mm -hmm. put holes in there, so really anything, it'll work, and it's actually on both sides of the room. I like that a lot. Beautiful, functional, stylish. And organized. And organized. Can we go outside and you talk a little bit about the style that you chose there in the kitchen? That would be great. Okay. The style our staff and the homeowner chose is a traditional style cherry cabinet. Mm -hmm. And we've got a beautiful dark rich finish on here. Um, we've also accented the mullion doors 
um, with an etched glass pattern. It's wonderful because you can do your china and collectibles yeah. inside the cabinets. Glass shelves with the glass panel. I like that a lot. You can see right through. I really like the trims, the moldings, everything that you put all along the cabinets, not just a corner. We've also added, um, these are fluted fillers and wood medallions, which also accent the architecture and the doorways of the home. Yeah, it really matches up nicely. And like I said earlier, I, I like the profile changes, how the cabinets jut in and out like that, and especially this wall over here. I mean, you've got... All the all alternating heights and depths. Yeah, and three different profiles that it comes out. I like that. And the crown molding really looks good along the top. We finished out the tops with a royal crown and then placed a rope molding on top. You can get creative with your molding. You can even paint the rope. Okay, anything you want to do. And over here at the racks on the corner next to the window, that really looks nice. Lots of room for knickknacks. Tell me a little bit over here on the other side of the kitchen though, between the great room and the kitchen itself under the archway. Describe this what you've done here. one of my favorite areas. We have an open view from the kitchen into the great room and we've added peninsula glass cabinets and they're actually structured into the archway as you can see and the arch on the wall cabinets match, match the doorway. And with the glass on both sides, you could really use it to display anything that you like. Right. Yeah. Now we call that the great room because it's the family room, but you guys built another great room in this house. Yes, I'll, we did. I want to go see this hobby room. Well, Tasha, this is one beautiful hobby room. They must yes, not have very is. messy hobbies. <laughs> no. This is, this is sharp. Tell me a little bit about it. This is the homeowner's favorite room, I think, and mine as well. This area over here is great for storage. Um, with the sink, you can do flower arranging, anything mm -hmm. that you want to do. Easy cleanup countertops. Mm -hmm. This is a very unique feature and something fun. You can put your wrapping paper in these drawers and then actually just roll it out on the countertop, cut it, and you're ready to do your packages. Oh, that is nice. And I love the way the countertop overhangs so you can slide chairs underneath right. there or stools. And Lots of extra storage down here. Yeah. You're talking about storage. Tell me about this. I mean, this is tall. These plenty are of space. wonderful. Yeah. This is great. Oh, wow. Pull Easy out pull shops. out trays. Love that. So, really, any hobby. Any hobbies, paper, is. anything that you want to organize inside here. Yeah, I love that. And up top, very, very deep storage areas, isn't it? That's great. And again, adjustable shelves. Right. I like that a lot. Tasha, thanks for all the help. Looks great. Thank you very much. Well, they say the heart of any home is the kitchen, and we took that to heart when we designed the project house. Family moving in wants to do a lot of entertaining, so we went big with everything, just like this enormous island. You can put a lot of cooks to work all the way around the edge of this island preparing food. If you're gonna be cooking a lot of food, you need a lot of appliances, and they really are the heart of the kitchen. We went with Gen Air's built-in cooktop. Wanted a big cooktop, and we went for that commercial stainless steel look that's so popular nowadays. We've got our different burners here got burners over on this side. We've even got a grill system right through the middle. So a lot of things we can do. Since we are gonna be cooking a lot of food, we went big on the ovens also. Both our convection ovens also came from Genair. It's standard to go 27 inches on a big one. We actually went to 30, so this is enormous. One thing that's really nice about it is it's a convection oven. The convection oven has a fan in the back that moves the air all the way around all the racks at the same time, so we have a consistent temperature. One nice feature about it is this probe that's actually in here. It just plugs into the oven itself, snap it in, slide it into your turkey. Let's say at Thanksgiving or Christmas you cook it, preset the temperature. When your turkey gets to that temperature, it will shut off the oven and everything will be exactly right. No more burnt turkeys at Christmas time. Since we're going to be cooking so much, we had to go with two dishwashers. Again, we went to commercial grade, Genera stainless steel. They're actually stainless steel on the interior as well. This is really nice because with stainless steel, you can use hotter water. The hotter water that we use, the more germs that we're gonna kill, the safer that our plates and glasses are gonna be. So we went stainless steel on the inside as well as the outside. Great kitchen, great appliances, plenty of room to entertain and the right appliances to do it.
Well, we're finally putting the finishing touches on our 16,000 square foot project house, and it has been a real adventure building this monster. We've been fortunate enough, though, to work with some of the highest quality product manufacturers in the whole home building industry. I'd like for you to take these next few minutes just to recap and see some of their products one more time and how the whole home came together. Like this amazing front entry, a 19 foot wrought iron and glass work of art with matching gas lanterns from Solera Doran Lanterns. Also from Solera, a custom wrought iron balcony incorporating design elements from the door to create a dynamic architectural presence in the front of the home. In the foyer, this beautiful elite bohemia crystal chandelier with Swarovski trimmings sets the tone for the elegance of the entire home. Manufactured in the Czech Republic, the chandelier is distributed in the U.S. by Bardell International. And the glass in our attractive, energy-efficient vinyl windows and exterior doors is super energy-efficient, low-E glass that meets the Department of Energy's Energy Star guidelines for energy efficiency. The stone-coated steel roof from Gerard is guaranteed for 50 years. This roof will stand up to baseball-size hail and can handle winds up to 125 miles per hour. Our pre-finished engineered wood floors from Mannington have a scratch-free surface that is guaranteed to last for years and years. And here are some more of the top quality products that our manufacturing partners have put into this amazing home.